I appreciate you having me here. I just want to make sure that my, there we go. So I'm, I'm an ER doc. Um, I, I work up at, at IU. I'm an associate professor there. I just completed my fellowship in disaster medicine. Uh, and disaster medicine is a, a study of systems and, and how systems and healthcare systems respond in times of crisis and in times of limited resources. And as part of my fellowship, I was able to uh, work in Liberia at JFK Hospital there, which is the central hospital and uh, the main referral hospital, the only academic center in Liberia. And I was there during the initial phases of the outbreak in Monrovia, and I took care of uh, the first patient that, that showed up at JFK Hospital. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences there, uh, a little bit of an intimate talk on, on some of my friends who, who dealt with the, uh, with the patients there, and then just to talk a little bit about some of the lessons that I, that I think I was able to, to garnish from a, a disaster perspective and from a systems perspective there. So the only financial disclosures I have is that I'm a, a, a special consultant for the Indiana State Department of Health uh, in their Ebola response plan. So I, I'd like to start these talks a little bit, just a, a background of, of the country of Liberia, just so we can kind of get a sense of what it's like over there and, and some of the challenges that, that Liberians face. And so some of this might be reviewed, and, and people tend to, to know a little bit about the country, um, which was founded by American, freed American slaves back in the, the 19th century. Uh, the, the motto of the country is the love of liberty brought us here. It's a very, you know, it has a rich cultural history. Unfortunately, Liberia underwent uh, about 15 years of civil war back in the, the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, uh, led by Charles Taylor there until 2003, when Nobel Prize winner uh, Ellen Sirleaf became president and brought uh, quite a bit of stability to the country. Uh, Liberia is, is obviously a tropical country. It's a, a country of about four and a half million people. Um, and uh, about 1.2 million of those people are in the, the capital city of Monrovia. So I kind of equate it to, to Indianapolis, where I'm from. It's about the same size of Indianapolis. And, uh, and, and, and and kind of has the same population. And so when I think of, of Monrovia as a city and, and the, the challenges they face, I like to think of, of how my city and, and my, my community would face some of the same challenges. Um, in 2008, they did a survey and there were 168 doctors in the entire country of four and a half million. So my healthcare system, I'm not sure what kind of healthcare systems you guys tend to work in, but my healthcare system alone has more doctors than the entire country of Liberia had in 2008. So when you go to Monrovia itself, um, you're, you're greeted with a lot of, of images and a lot of scars of the war. And so when you're still there, there's a lot of, of buildings that are still shelled out and bombed. Uh, the picture on the, the right there is a, a five-star European style hotel in the, the, the central part of the city. It's the, the highest point of the city and it's still been abandoned since the war. Um, there's a number of slums that uh, that are that are crowded that that have zero infrastructure. There's no running water, no electricity in, in some of them. The main parts of the city, the more the more industrious parts of the city, do have electricity. They do have running water, but there's daily power outages. There's daily uh, fires in the city, um, and and there's daily challenges to living. There's not a whole lot of, of, of grown crops there in Liberia. So most of the, the food gets imported. Uh, so most of the, the food that, that people eat in Liberia, in Monrovia in particular, has to be imported from, uh, from Western nations. Um, there's the, the, the picture up at the top left is a picture of one of the larger slums. Uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, how Ebola has affected that. And then the, the bottom left picture is just a scene from, from one of the general marketplaces there in, in the city of Monrovia. So I worked at uh, JFK Hospital, which, like I said, is the um, is the the primary referral center uh, and the only the only academic medical center in Monrovia. It was built back in the 1960s by a grant from the U.S. government. It's named after John F. Kennedy, obviously, um, and it was meant at the in, in the 60s when it was built. It was meant to be a referral hospital for all of West Africa, and uh, at the time before the war, it, it actually was used by heads of state in in the region. They would send if they were sick, they would go to to Liberia to to, to be taken care of here. Um, and and it, it was kind of the, the crown jewel of healthcare in West Africa at the time. Since the war, obviously, it fell into disrepair. A number of doctors uh, expatriated and, and left the country. And the ones that stayed behind uh, tell really tragic stories of, of things that happened in their hospital during the, the times of the war. 
you can see the, uh, the, the, the bottom picture there is a picture of the main hospital and on the, they tell stories of, of, of how machine gunners would, would sit on the top floor and, and kind of spy out over the city and, and uh, you know, shoot people in the streets from up there. Um, the hospital itself is about 800 beds. The main hospital is about 800 beds. Uh, the facilities are a little bit in disrepair and they only have about two or 300 beds in use right now. Uh, there is a maternity hospital which is in much better condition on the same campus and uh, there's a nursing school as well as a PA school and they also take a number of uh, medical students from the University of Liberia uh, on campus to, to take care of patients there and they just started a medicine residency two years ago there. So the work I did in Liberia was all around the systems issues and, and at JFK we were trying to get the administration to start thinking about uh, better ways of, of decision making and, and, and uh, resource utilization in times of crisis. And in the times of crisis at this hospital were basically all of the time. They reported daily power outages where the generator would, would fail in the backup when, when the city's power would go out uh, during the dry season, they would, they would have lack of water. And, uh, and just a couple of examples of things that we encountered in there. I work specifically in the emergency department setting up a critical care unit in their emergency department and uh, they, we, we trained them on the use of their first four uh, Philips electronic monitors. So this is a big deal to them to have 24 hour monitoring of patients. Um, the, the nurses in the emergency department uh, before we got there would carry around about five pairs of gloves with them and that was their ration of gloves for the day. So they had to make decisions uh, on a day-to-day -day basis on which patients they would glove up for, which patients they would just touch with their bare hands and, and wash after. And then a lot of times they didn't even wash, it was just kind of a, um, you know, the, the, the culture there that, that, that hand washing wasn't, wasn't as necessary of a thing. Uh, they did have four ventilators there. Uh, they had uh, respiratory therapists there, but their four ventilators, they only had one power cord. So one of the most significant things I did uh, on my second trip back was actually bring more power cords. I feel like that's the biggest impact I actually made on healthcare in Liberia was, was bringing some extra power cords. And because of that, and because of the, the respiratory therapy coverage, they had to make decisions on who to intubate and who to not intubate and how to, to make healthcare. Uh, decisions that way. They had no CT scanner, for example, there. Uh, I was able to do a, uh, a, a little study uh, there on, on the number of patients that came through the emergency department and just to highlight the types of patients they see, uh, about 50% of the patients who came into their emergency department were there for infectious symptoms. Um, and so obviously uh, malaria is endemic in the country, TB is endemic, um, yellow fever and, and cholera and, and HIV are endemic there. And so they actually treated TB and, um, and malaria at outpatient clinics. So there's a large outpatient center and they would send most of their infectious people um, into these, these clinics to be treated. So um, I was there in early September doing a, 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 a lot of work around these kinds of systems issues. This is September of last year. And we did what was called a hazard vulner vulnerability analysis just to talk to the administrators and the chief doctors and the, uh, the head, the head of, of medicine and the nurses there to, to kind of figure out what were the existential threats to, to healthcare at JFK? You know, what would shut the place down? What, how had they planned for it? And most of the thoughts were around just lack of supplies, lack of resources, lack of doctors and nurses, and could they keep up this kind of pace that they had? already and, and it was a feverish thing where, where doctors were working all the time. Um, but then they also talked about their, their fires they had. They had no fire control system. So if one of their buildings were to burn down, what would they do with the patients? Uh, how would they continue to care for them? And so that was some of the work we did. Um, eerily, one of the older doctors there, Dr. Brisbane, who was the head of the emergency department, had taken care of a case of Lassa fever about five years previously, and it was a single incident, uh, single isolated case. And his comment was, you know, what he feared besides civil unrest, but what he feared was the potential for another viral hemorrhagic fever to uh, become epidemic in his country and to, to threaten healthcare there. So I was there in September of last year and I had planned on going back in April to continue some of the work that, uh, that I had started there, some of the trauma studies I was doing. I was working with some EMS uh, uh, systems in, in their initial planning phases. Uh, but Ebola had really kind of uh, started taking off in early April 
as uh, up in the northern parts of the country in the rural areas. And so my, uh, during my fellowship directors decided that it was too unsafe for me to go there, ironically. Um, and so I, I changed my plans to go in, in June, uh, and we kind of evaluated the, the outbreak at that time, and it had seemed to die down a little bit, and it had remained relatively contained in the northern parts of the country. So I went back in the middle of June, and I had, I had been there for about a week doing my work when the first couple of cases hit the city. Uh, the city of Monrovia. It was a family. Uh, I think about seven different people uh, had come down with it, and they actually went to a hospital, one of the community hospitals called Redemption, and they all ended up dying there at Redemption. And uh, a number of healthcare workers at that hospital, uh, I think it was two nurses and a, a doctor, um, ended up contracting Ebola there and dying. And so all of the staff at Redemption Hospital stopped going to work. They just stopped showing up. The hospital closed down. This was the free hospital in the in the city. So uh, this is where indigent care was was being provided in the city. So there was a lot of fear at our hospital at JFK, and the administration was was obviously rightly concerned about this. And there was a lot of of worry about what would happen if an Ebola case showed up at at JFK and how they would take care of it and what their their plan was. Um, and there's a little bit of a historical rift between JFK and the Ministry of Health that was, that was going on. So JFK is a government-funded institution. The head of uh, the general administrator of JFK is a political appointee as well as the chief medical officer there. And so they competed for a little bit of dollars with the, um, with the Ministry of Health, who was in charge of the Ebola response throughout the country and who uh, was responsible for, for receiving financial aid and the international finances and delivering health care. So the Ministry of Health had set up a number of Ebola treatment centers. They were the ones purchasing the, the PPE. They were the ones running the training sessions. And they wanted JFK to be an Ebola treatment center. But um, the JFK administrators were, were upset that they were not getting the, seeing some of the funds that the Ministry of Health had been receiving. They were not receiving training. And they were concerned, obviously, that their nurses would be exposed to Ebola if, uh, if, if people were referred to there. So there was a little bit of a rift between the two. And uh, JFK had kind of made a, a little bit of a, a nearsighted plan just not to come up with a plan. And their Ebola response plan was, if anybody with Ebola shows up in our hospital or at our gates, we're going to refer them to one of these ministry treatment centers. So I showed up to work um, one morning at about 7 AM. I, I, I went over to the emergency department, as I normally did. And I ran into one of my, my young doctor friends there, Dr. Ireland, who's a recent graduate from their, uh, from their residency program. And he was, he was concerned, he was agitated, he was sitting on the phone uh, trying to call people. And I asked him, I said, Philip, you know, what's going on, what's wrong? And uh, he said, I, th I think there's an Ebola patient in our emergency department. Um, and I, I think they've been there all night. So the story is this, that, uh, about midnight the night before, uh, this patient had been brought in by his wife, and the wife had told the doctors and the nurses who received him in the middle of the night that the patient was having a malaria uh, exacerbation, a malaria episode, and that he was sick and he needed to come into the hospital. And so he had sat in this emergency department uh, for about seven hours, being evaluated by the NPs and the uh, the intern who was on call that night, and the uh, the other patients around him, he had been sitting there for about seven hours before somebody on the day shift actually recognized this patient. Uh, the patient was a PA who had been working in the community and had been dealing with people with bleeding issues all week long, and he had been having about three days of symptoms. And um, the wife actually had lied to get him into the emergency department. They, they knew he had, or suspected he had Ebola, and so they lied to get him into JFK, where they thought he would be cared for uh, most appropriately. So my friend Philip was on the phone. He was calling his bosses. He was calling the head of medicine in the hospital. He was calling the chief of the emergency department. He was calling the Ministry of Health. They needed the testing. They needed to get him out of there. And um, I said, Philip, is this guy in isolation yet? Is he, is he still in the emergency department? And Philip said, I, I haven't even been in there yet. So we, we, we went to the emergency department, and uh, that's a picture of, the, not this case, but the picture of the emergency department there on the left. And it, it, the, it, the, the layout was very minimal. There's two rooms, and one medical room and one trauma room. And the medical room was probably 20% you know, the size of this room, and there were maybe about 20 beds there. 
It was uh, internal to the hospital. There were no windows, no air conditioning, no ventilation. There was a kind of fetid smell when you go into it, and it was kind of dimly lit. And we went into the emergency department, and there were just patients laying there, um, you know, on their beds. There was a couple of nurses wandering about, and there was this, this patient, uh, the, the one that suspected of having Ebola. He was pretty obtunded. He was septic by this point, uh, pretty diaphoretic. And he was just sitting there in the middle of the room in, amongst all these beds. And so we, we started scrambling. Uh, a couple of other doctors came down, the, 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 the bosses of the hospital, Dr. Brisbane and Dr. Borbor. And uh, we were trying to scramble for a plan. We were trying to think of all these things that we had to do for this potential Ebola case on the fly. You know, how, where could we put them? What kind of room could we put them in that had isolation? Uh, could, could we get a sharps container in there? Could we get our supplies in there? How do we clean this room after he's gone? Uh, what do we do with his waste? Uh, you know, and I was trying to remember. I'd read up on it, but obviously in the heat of the moment, you're not remembering all of the... Uh, you know, all the things that you're supposed to do, and could we flush it down the toilet, and could we uh, bag, do we have to bag it up, do we have to collect it, and so all these thoughts were going through our head, and at the same time, we're trying to get the, the appropriate PPE, the hospital had them, um, it had ordered a couple suits, but they weren't at the bedside, so we're sending nurses to go find those for us, we're telling them to get us um, some pieces of paper so we could write down the names of the people in the emergency department for contact tracing later on, and so we're trying to do all of this simultaneously, you know, and, and trying to scramble for what needed to be done. So we found a room at the back of this room. So there's a, a room kind of behind the one there. Uh, the, the right side picture is the charge nurse that day. Her name is Rita. Um, she help, was immensely helpful during all of this. And we found this room that we wanted to put the patient in. And so a couple of the doctors gowned up and they actually called in two janitors to gown up and help lift the, or help move the patient. And I don't think these janitors had even ever worn latex gloves in their lives. Uh, two young men, probably about 18 years old. Uh, as the only white person in the room, they would not let me touch the patient. They said they don't want an international incident. Um, so they refused to let me uh, uh, within a foot of the patient. But so they, 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 they gowned up as best they could. None of them had ever worn full protective equipment before. Um, these two janitors were obviously scared. I think everybody pretty much knew at this point what was going on. Most of the nurses had abandoned the emergency department. Most of the patients, if they could, uh, had left with their family. And so they had all kind of gone out of the room. And they tried to push the bed that this patient was on, this big, large iron bed, into the uh, the isolation room they're at, they're, they were going into, but the isolation, the bed was too wide for the doors to get into the isolation room, so they had to abandon that, and four of them lifted this patient up. Everybody was sweating profusely. Their masks were kind of slipping down. Uh, they were just lifting up the mattress, but then the iron bed was in between them, so they couldn't quite lift the mattress over the iron bed, and they ended up having to put the patient on the floor and, and physically scoot him into the room. And during all of this, he started having agonal respirations. And so one of the doctors was on the floor with him in the, the uh, isolation room once they got him in, trying to, to mess with his airway. And the janitors, in the, in the meantime, were trying to come out of the room with all of their gear on. And I was yelling at them to stop and, and not touch the walls. And, and I was trying to pantomime to them how to, how to take off their, their, their PPE without, um, without contaminating anything. And the, the patient ended up dying pretty much quickly right after, and, and everybody was able to come out of the room, drop all their PPE in the room, wash three, four, five times, and, and kind of go from there. Uh, so that patient, patient died pretty quickly. Um, and so after that, we ended up, did, we did end up testing him. He was positive. Uh, he stayed in the emergency department for about nine hours before the ministry could remove the body. Um, one of the, the primary things we tried to do was contact tracing. I was, you know, I was hitting up Rita pretty hard. I said, you have to give me every name of the patient that was in there overnight. Uh, we have to uh, identify the patients, the family, the nurses. And no matter how much I hit her, I would get a list that was a little bit bigger each time. Uh, but those, those two uh, janitor's names were never on there. So, I, so even to this day, I don't know uh, their fate. I don't know what happened to them. They were intimately involved with this, this patient's you know, movement and care. Um, but they were, they were uh, lost to follow up, essentially. Um, we did, the rest of the time I spent at the hospital, we essentially enacted, within a, a five-day period, we enacted an Ebola containment plan. Uh, the, 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 the mainstays of this were to lock down the hospital, uh, to basically limit entrances to three different entrances, and put a triage station at each, 
outside of each entrance where the nurses would basically question each patient and take a temperature. And so we came up with a rudimentary Ebola screening process and it was difficult because most people were there for malaria checks or TB checks, so, so half the people coming in had a fever. And then we would put them in a little ante room if we were concerned about Ebola where a doctor would evaluate them and then if they were positive, send them to, to one of these ministries uh, Ebola treatment centers. So I think during the week I was there following, we were able to successfully screen away about four or five patients who were trying to get in uh, to the Ebola treatment center, or to, to JFK, and, and send them to uh, one of the Ebola treatment centers. And so I, th I, I consider that a success on our part. And then we, we just, we encouraged them to have basically incident command type of structure. We wanted them to have one focus of, 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 of of decision-making authority where people could come in and they would be able to meet on a daily basis. They would have meetings with the nursing staff, they would have meetings with the Ministry of Health, they would have meetings with the, the, the doctors and, and everybody was on the same page. And so we tried to enact some of these, these incident command type of uh, decision-making rules around them. And then I just spent the rest of the time doing educational work. I, I gave Ebola talks to janitors and to laundry service people and to the nursing school and to, uh, to the doctors and to the nurses and just tried to kind of really raise the level of awareness and education before I went back. So this is uh, my friend Dr. C.M. Brisbane. Uh, he was the head of the emergency department. He was 73 years old. Uh, about a, a week after I came back, uh, I got a phone call that he tested positive for Ebola and he ended up dying. Um, his family's in Toledo, Ohio. I met his wife. I got to go to his memorial service. This is uh, this is Dr. Borbor, uh, who is the, the chief of internal medicine. Uh, he ended up dying. And then this is my friend, um, Philip Ireland, who was one of the first to receive the ZMAP treatment. And this is him walking out of Ebola treatment. So I think there's a lot of lessons that we can kind of take away from this. And as a systems person, I've been dealing a lot with uh, EMS in, in the city of Indianapolis and how they're going to respond to Ebola, how my hospital's going to respond to Ebola, the rules that the State Department has to come up with. And so, so there's, I think there's a number of generalizable rules that we can, we can take away from this. And one of these is, uh, this is something I think we learned after 9-11, uh, you know, after the big, you know, the big terrorist threats and everything. And we spent a ton of money in this country on, on some very focused uh, responses and very focused rules. Like uh, there's charts in my hospital to this day on how to recognize smallpox and how to recognize anthrax. And, and we spent a lot of money on some very focused types of, of issues where I think the response now has to be a generalizable response. Whatever we're doing for Ebola, we have to be able to say that this, is, this, this kind of thing can be used in other situations. And so some of the responses that we have to Ebola are going to be the same kind of responses we have when the pandemic flu hits us. Um, and so, so the general levels of awareness and training and decision making, I think, are things that we can use in our day-to-day -day lives and our day-to-day um, operations because we do deal with bad things in our hospitals. We deal with tuberculosis, we deal with the enterovirus, we deal with HIV, and these things are daily threats and there's any, you know, any time a new epidemic can come. And so I think we, we can use this Ebola opportunity to prepare generally uh, as a hospital system. One of the things that I think worries me the most is what's going to happen to West Africa. And so right now, uh, and, and there's been a lot of news stories, and if you follow the, the stories closely in West Africa, you'll see stories of one of the slums, uh, West Point in Liberia, in Monrovia. Uh, they broke into one of the Ebola treatment centers and, and everybody escaped that was in one of those treatment centers. And so the city quarantined the entire slum and there were riots and there were police shooting people in the streets. Um, food prices are exponentially soaring now, so it is, it is expensive to eat in Monrovia right now. All the school systems are closed down, so uh, there are years of education uh, being lost in, in Monrovia right now. Excuse me, I have a dry mouth. Mm. And so uh, I think one of the more worrisome things to me is that um, this disease, this epidemic is targeting healthcare workers. And so there was already a fragile system in place. Uh, it was already depleted of, of human beings and of drugs and of, of saline and of IV equipment. They have one presser in the entire country. They use um, uh, Epi. 
And so you take an already stressed system and you kill a number of the doctors and nurses and you're going to have an incredibly stressed system following onto that. And so I think the next epidemic that hits after they can control of the Ebola virus is going to be even more deadly and it's going to be even more threatening to the, the stability of that country. And so I think for us, uh, and for, for, the, for the first world, we need to spend money and we need to focus on stabilizing that country and stabilizing that healthcare system to prevent the next thing after Ebola, after we're able to contain the Ebola crisis there. And so um, one of the things we, we preach in disaster medicine is that the more robust the system when it gets struck, the more robust the recovery. It's just like a patient who gets an infection. The more healthy they are at the beginning, the more likely they are to recover from that infection. Uh, and so, so one of the things that, that we, I, I try to emphasize is that a community is better able to respond to a disaster, whether it's an epidemic or a tornado or any other kinds of disaster, if they have good infrastructure in place. And that's not only healthcare systems and it's not only supplies, but it's roadways. It's, um, you know, good telecommunication systems. It's a educated and, and literate populace that can, can you know, understand these things. And so one of the things that, that we can focus on as a people is a more robust community and healthcare system that can better respond to this type of crisis. And I'm confident that we are going to see more cases in the United States, but I'm also confident that because of our systems issues that we're going to be able to recover it and it's not going to hit us uh, to the level that, that it's, it's devastated West Africa. And my final point is, these are our friends. These are people who are intelligent and they're facing very difficult times. So thank you very much.